Hi, my name's Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. In this, the second part of Natural Plasma Bulls and Lena, Fireball Phenomena in Hestalen, Norway, I want to talk about the study that was conducted in 2002 by an Italian group uh, and it was an optical and ground survey in Hestalen and it was carried out uh, by Massimo Teodorani, PhD, He's an astrophysicist and Gloria Nobili, a physicist from the Museum of Physics Department, Bologna University. So straight off, I, I just want to talk about some uh, interesting comments. Uh, you can go and have a look at this document yourself by uh, clicking on this link here. Some interesting extracts. On the estimated amount of power to create such an effect, they said by using photometric analysis, uh, it showed that the light phenomenon is able to produce a luminous power of up to 100 kilowatts. In explaining that the phenomenon may be similar to a proposed model of ball lightning put forward in 2000, they say there were no lightning discharges when the light balls were recorded, but some other types of electric discharge may occur in the valley due to a strong abundance of copper and quartz, of which the Hestalen area is very rich and which can cause piezoelectricity very efficiently. So the ball lightning model they are referring to, I've given a link to here, and it is here, and uh, as you can see, it's on the old BBC News site. It's from uh, the 3rd of February 2000. Uh, but essentially, uh, when you go into it, into the meat of it, uh, it's essentially nanoparticles of silicon metal, uh, silicon monoxide and silicon carbide formed in the ground during lightning strike feed the ball of light. Lightning penetrating below the surface of the soil heats a certain portion of it to quite high temperatures so it vaporises. And this is Dr. Abrahamson telling the BBC. And then when the lightning strike has finished, the vapour is free to erupt, to appear above the ground in the form of a ball. The jet of a hot gas will be very much the same as a jet coming out of one's mouth when one blows a smoke ring. It forms a little recirculating vortex that is quite self-contained. Very, very interesting. So what he's saying is the lightning strike hits the ground, it melts some stuff under the ground, and uh, some of that then, when the lightning pressure comes off as the discharge ends, it flies up, and uh, the, there's obviously some friction or something on the side, and as it flies up, the bit in the middle is fly, fly, flying faster, and this vaporized material, which is uh, in the paper, uh, uh, they uh, assume it or believe it to be silicon metal, silicon monoxide, and silicon carbide, it comes up and it forms a torus uh, coming up, uh, highly charged particles. And actually, the Chinese spectrographic study uh, cited above does subscribe to this uh, particular theory. And it also calculated that the rate of heat release uh, was estimated to 79 kilowatts, which is quite similar to the 100 kilowatts that the Italians have determined from the light uh, phenomena at Herstalin. And that's per meter cubed of ball volume. So, you know, some of these balls at Herstalin have been determined to be really rather large. So this is uh, certainly a comparable number in the same order of magnitude. And so uh, taken together, they do actually appear quite compelling. And then there was another study in Tel Aviv where they used microwaves and silicon to create a sort of visually si uh, similar phenomenon. Um, however, it doesn't explain the many ball lightning observations such as spiral and discontinuous paths observed in Hestalen, which we talked about in the first part of this series. In fact, Dr. George Eagley reported in one case where ball lightning travelled alongside a moving train carriage. It then touched uh, the aluminium window frame. And the source of the report then described how he was able to manipulate the cold aluminium of the frame with his fingers for around 20 minutes. Uh, in another case, all of the wire in a house exploded and vaporised during an interaction. These cases potentially point to some strange electron interaction phenomena underway. Moreover, Ken Shoulders created balls of light out of self-organising electrons in apparatus that had no opportunity for chemical reactions, but which synthesised new elements. So, for instance, he was discharging from a, a tip that was wetted with mercury and it was forming a torus, much like the theory of ball lightning by Abrahams and Dennis, uh, except that is essentially just electrons with a few ions, say, of, of mercury in there. And if there was a gas in there, let's say it was... 
uh, low-level hydrogen um, uh, or low-level xenon or, or krypton or, or some uh, noble gas. Those were the ions that were going in and ordinarily you wouldn't expect much of a chemical reaction to go on um, between uh, those uh, constituent elements. But he was seeing these self-organized balls of light uh, that he could manipulate and kept fed and so forth. The idea behind Abramson, Dennis, is, is that the uh, silicon, silicon monoxide and silicon carbide effectively just kind of slowly oxidize in, in this uh, almost like a, an aerogel, a kind of fluffy ball of, of these various uh, nanoparticles. But it just doesn't even come close to explaining some of these phenomena. So the range of uh, observed phenomenon uh, keeps uh, fertile minds active. And, and here, th there's another uh, one I link to here. And here it is. It's in uh, Annales Geophysicae. And uh, they actually refer to the Abraham um, uh, Dennis uh, uh, work. They, they don't credit him with some things that actually are explained within that uh, uh, paper. But uh, down here, he's saying that essentially there's a there's a core in the center that's very positively charged. And then there's a um, sort of electromagnetic radiation in there's a vacuum and then an electron layer on the outside that then ends up with this soft uh, area on the outside, the plasma layer. So this is more structured than just a, 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 a sort of fluffy mass of stuff that's slowly oxidizing. And in that document, he cites Singer uh, from 1972, who said ball lightning is formed by high energy events such as lightning, volcanoes, tornadoes, earthquakes and meteors. Since there is typically no lightning before emergence of the Hestalen light balls and no lightning uh, during the Italian study, they may be suggesting that sudden discharges of static electricity caused by geology can initiate the same phenomena in addition to the modes recorded by Singer. So other than these modes here, which some of them may actually be caused by uh, this ge geological structure, so you've got earthquakes here and you've got volcanoes. Well, there's a lot of friction between particles coming out of a volcano, but... Um, Certainly with earthquakes, that's uh, more sort of uh, 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 tectonic, it's uh, uh, geology. So essentially when you've got this uh, copper and, and uh, piezo um, crystals uh, of quartz, you, I, I, I will discuss that later, how that may uh, actually occur. So anyway, in this BBC article, and I'm just taking this aside here because I think it's absolutely fascinating, as an interesting aside, for those with long-term interest in Lena, the BBC article on ball lightning that re the Italians refer to takes an opinion from one Dr. Graham Hubbler. So if I go to it here, and it talks about it, here's these uh, fluffy particles, and this is from their lab work uh, here, uh, and, and so forth. But down here it says Dr. Graham Hubbler. Okay. Now, I immediately recognize this. <laughs> I recognize this name, but anyway, in the article it was saying, at the time, he, in 2000, he worked at the United States Naval Research Laboratory, NRL, and he later went on to become the director of the Sydney Kimmel Institute for Nuclear Renaissance, Skinner, at the University of Missouri, where ICCF 18 was hosted, and I actually saw him at this presentation at University of M Missouri when he was talking about how Skinner came about, so... Of course, when he's talking in the BBC article in uh, 2000, you know, he, he was at working at uh, United States Naval Research Laboratory. I had no idea that he'd come from that. But uh, when I looked back at this video, which is a presentation that I actually saw, um, everything started to uh, sort of fit together. <laughs> he talked about the timeline between 1989 to uh, where they were in, in uh, uh, ICCF 18. Uh, and here we go, we've got the CBS uh, 60 Minutes here. And he's saying at this point, uh, when this went out, it seemed to be very positive for the field, but also the, the, the military then became a little bit um, less likely to want to fund it, and, and, and it was uh, uh, Sidney Kimmel that came along and uh, was supporting uh, work and so forth. But actually, so it, claims, it seems to state here that NRL, Energetics in Israel, ENA in Italy and SRI were all being sub sponsored or supported by the US military kind of operations and, and funding groups. 
right away from the beginning. Uh, and uh, the other thing that's interesting, and, and I said this uh, more recently, that obviously you had Pons and Fleissman announcing in March uh, uh, 1989. Well, later that year, there was a group out of Brookhaven uh, National Laboratories that announced something that was called uh, cluster impact fusion. And this was talking about, uh, you know, uh, bubbling uh, so something, uh, deuterium or whatever it was through, uh, or something through heavy water uh, and, and, and uh, creating some ionization and creating some clusters and then putting an electric field and accelerating them into uh, a deuteride material, some, something along those lines. And, and I have shared that before. Um, but there was actually, uh, according to another uh, person, a, a piece of um, technology called cluster impact fusion that was classified in 1990, shortly after this uh, report in science by, um, uh, what is it, by uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, um, that was classified from SRI. And uh, it did sound a lot like uh, exotic vacuum objects or a s similar technology. Anyway, so we have these uh, things here, and, and then all these things seem to be funded by the military. And the person that's working at Naval uh, Research Laboratory here uh, ends up running the Sid Sydney Kimmel Institute for Nuclear Re Renaissance. And that essentially brings us all the way up to essentially the Skinner operation uh, finished in, uh, or we're told it finished, uh, between, I think it was uh, ICCF. Um, 20 and ICCF 21 and the coalescence sort of shut up shop at the same sort of time I don't know about re research uh, whether that uh, shut up shop uh, but it, it would appear that the early days there was actually uh, military funding going into uh, these operations so you can listen to this yourself and see what you think but um, I had no idea that the head of Sydney Kimmel Institute for Nuclear Renaissance uh, was actually formerly uh, at United States Naval Research Laboratory. But then there is this, Dr. Graham Hubbler of the United States Naval Research Laboratory, who has taken a keen interest in lightning balls, says that the research has much promise. I have followed the theories that have come out over the years, and few can explain all of the features of ball lightning. This one, however, unifies an awful lot of the properties of ball lightning under one theoretical umbrella. So I think it stands a very good chance of perhaps being correct. It's not necessarily the whole story or even the story, but the nice thing about it is that it can be tested experimentally. Then we'll know whether this theory has any merit in the future. Now, for me, this is interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly, why out of all of the people in the world uh, to choose from in 2000, did the BBC get a comment from a researcher at the US Naval Research Laboratories? Secondly, why was the US Naval Research Laboratory researcher taking a keen interest in lightning balls? Thirdly, why would the same person be, on the one hand, so keen to support a chemical explanation, and on the other hand, pepper his response with caveats? He's basically saying, well, it might not be, the, it, it could be an explanation, and but then it might not be the whole story or even the story, but it can be tested. And then maybe we'll know if it has any merit in the future. So I think this is really, really interesting. Anyway, moving on. The Italian researchers reported that on their Hestalen visit, uh, they mentioned a number of times that the phenomenon blinked. In almost all cases, the light appeared very close to the ground, up to tens of metres. It blinked very fastly, uh, that's Italian translation for you there, uh, very quickly I guess, uh, with a pulsation rate of less than one half second and the entire performance lasted from one up to 30 seconds, most frequently five seconds. So they're clearly talking about quite a lot of uh, uh, observations. So it would seem that if you want to observe ball lightning, you really have to go to Norway to the Hestalen Valley. Uh, they also talked about fragmentation. The light phenomenon showed to eject a smaller light ball. This behaviour was very well observed and studied in a previous mission. As part of the group's work, the researchers collected ground samples which were suspected to be approached by the light phenomenon. And this is something that we're going to go and talk about in the next video. So thank you for your time. I think it's very interesting 
that uh, I, I can revisit uh, who funded what and when uh, in the US and in Italy and in Israel, uh, and that these parties are very interested, uh, seemingly, uh, by the, the basis of what is being reported here in a ball lightning in 2000, uh, year 2000. And uh, uh, you should be aware that there are many different models of uh, ball lightning, but it's it's well worth to go and review the Abramson model and uh, this uh, uh, other model by D. B. Muldrew, just just to give you an idea how the same thing can be explained in very different ways. Ways, but some of the phenomenon are simply not things that can be explained, in my view, by the Abramson-Dennis uh, theory.